But now we're talking about the MJTF police. In approximately March of 1989, a sequence of political actions was initiated whereby the federal government extorted resources from most of the states, if not all 50 states. Now, I transcribed this. This was such important material, I started transcribing it off the videotape. And if you've ever done that, you know, you run the video as much as you think you can type in, then you type it in on your computer, and then you back it up and run it again. It's a very tedious thing, and I worked for some two weeks transcribing mm. this, and then I found it was already transcribed in a book. <laughs> oh, no. And uh, so I'm, I'm going out of, out of this transcription in the book here. All right, so the federal government extorted resources from most of the states, if not all 50 states, simultaneously within a two-week period, passing laws in every state authorizing the use of federal funding to convert local and state forces into national police forces. So this is the process of the nationalizing of our police forces. It began in 1989 in a very direct way. Not too long after the initiative, President Bush brought the phrase, the New World Order, out of the closet into the open. The MJTF police are in virtually every state of the Union of the United States at this time. Their primary mission is house-to-house -house search and seizure, separation and categorization of men, women, and children in large numbers, the transferal to detention facilities, and the use of those facilities for interrogation purposes. Mm. Did you catch that, John? Mm. Now, we have here the detention facilities that were authorized through FEMA and augmented by Department of Defense budget amendment passed with the 1991 fiscal budget. Here are the locations, the original 23 locations under FEMA. Each site can detain between 32,000 to 44,000 people minimum. That's minimum. It is indicated that the Texas and Alaskan sites may be much larger and more heavily armed. And so here you have them. You have three here in New York. You have four here in Ohio, three in Illinois, three in Michigan, one in Wisconsin, three in Nebraska, three in Wyoming, two in Texas, and one in Alaska. For the area west of the Mississippi, Oklahoma City is the central processing point for detainees and can handle up to 100,000 people at a time. The Eastern Processing Center is not yet identified at this time. It's believed that it may be Fort Drum in New York State. Of the detention facilities, 23 are FEMA authorized and uh, stationed. 20 are Department of Defense budget authorized and stationed, making a total of 43 uh, total detention sites. And you know about detention sites from World War II? What happens at these places? And these this are not only happened in Germany, it happened in America with the, J with with the, the Japanese, Japanese Americans. Japanese Americans. And... Uh, so some of these are identified here as known facilities, others confirmed by government document location number. Now what are the plans for if, if what happens, the people go to these now? Okay, that's what this, now this counterintelligence briefing is all about that. We're going to find out what, okay. what, the, what they have found out from their intelligence okay. analysis. MJTF police, their primary mission is house-to-house -house search and seizure, separation and categorization of men, women, and children in large numbers, the transferal to detention facilities, and the use of those facilities for interrogation purposes. The MJTF are regular National Guard comprised of local law enforcement personnel and street gangs being utilized street gangs. for national police services. Street gangs? Did I hear you right? Yes, this is a, a very interesting development. Now, no, I wait, no, wait, no, wait, no, wait, no, wait. This is saying, and this is already in effect, that our government is going to use street gangs for law enforcement? Okay, ju just w wait a minute. I want to get a newspaper that just well, came know, out this just, weekend, John. You just read that and went right through that and just zipped through that, and my antennas went up, and I just got to make sure that you said what I thought you said. Yes, the government is very interested, apparently, and according to this uh, analysis, and we have some very interesting material that just came in on a paper this weekend from the Orlando Sentinel. You see, when, you, when it comes down to the point where they're going to take the guns away from the people and search for drugs and resistors to the New World Order, you've got to have the people who, like the BATF at Waco, bust down the doors, go in, search the place, and a lot of them are going to get killed. And the average... 
uh, BATF man makes between forty-seven and fifty-four thousand dollars a year. He's not wanting to be killed and, you know, leave his family uh, fatherless and husbandless. And so they are interested in utilizing street gang leaders because they ha they are like a paramilitary group already. They've learned how to enforce discipline and have a military style organization. If they can incorporate them into the uh, expendable force that will be the frontline shock stormtroopers against the American people, then, then the other fellows, you know, don't run the risks that Getting these killed. people do. Now, the gangs apparently that are being considered are gangs such as the Bloods and the Crips in uh, yeah. Los Angeles. Yeah. Now here, notice this in the Orlando Sentinels. This just came out Saturday, October 30, 1993. Gangs lay down colors and rivalry to join forces against fire. So already they're utilizing them in fighting fires. And these are the Bloods and the Crips, the same ones that this intelligence analyst said. And I tell you, John, I had the same reaction as you did when I first heard this. Gangs. Total disbelief. Imagine gang leaders of the Bloods and the Crips, they use Uzi uh, submachine guns yes. in their gang warfare and all of this, but it's not so far-fetched. What happened in Haiti when the UN and the U.S. forces came to, uh, to uh, land and to dock? What happened? The Haitian government that is opposing Aristide, the military government, they didn't use their own troops to oppose them. They used gangs. gangs. They yeah. used armed gangs yeah. that were in collaboration yeah. with the military to rough up and, and kill people and, and scare the uh, U.S. forces so they wouldn't get off the boat. And these guys have nothing, they feel like they have nothing to lose. They're facing death all the time anyway, and, and they don't have the kind of commitments that uh, the regular BATF men are going to have. But notice what this says here. Gangs lay down colors, rivalry to join forces against fire. And there's a picture of these uh, people. Uh, Sierra Madre, California. On the steep, steep chaparral-covered slopes of the San Gabriel Mountains, the blue of the Crips and the red of the Bloods were joined in a painted band on the tools of a unique team of firefighters. It shows our bond of unity, Maurice White said of the two stripes on the handle of his tool, a combination rake and hoe. Out here we are all brothers. The 24-year-old member of the four Trey Crips took his place in the hot dust Thursday beside members of the rival Bloods and other gangs to dig a two-foot wide fire line. Now these are I mean, these gangs are death on each other. All of a sudden now, the government is using them as firefighters and, as Cornkey says, from according to his intelligence, for use in the MJTF police. Usually red and blue mark the differences between the gangs and fighting can erupt if the wrong color is flashed at a rival member. Gang members, former members, and their neighbors from, form a U.S. Forest Service crew called the South Central Panthers named after the Los Angeles neighborhood ravaged by rioting in 1992. So it's not such a novel concept. And what did the Roman Catholic Church do during the Dark Ages, John? They he said, the people. They said, anyone who wants to join this crusade, you know, you can join. And they Rally had all kinds of criminals join against the Waldenses, Absolutely. against the Hussites. Mob rule. And, and therefore, you have all these expendable criminals that go in the vanguard of the army and they can never to be do accused. the dirty work. We, oh, we had nothing to do with it. It was the, it was the populace that did it. The, the people did it. Yes. And here, uh, let me look at, at my notes here because I think they're a little more detailed. I think there was some that was uh, clipped there a little bit. Uh, the MJTF are the regular National Guard, and, and I copied it word for word. It's a, a little more literal translation than the, uh, not translation, but transcription. Our regular National Guard, local law enforcement, and street gangs converted to national police services. Remember that this was organized under George Herbert Walker Bush. We all know, of course, now that President Clinton has proposed a national police force. Mm. This is simply another name, an overt name, for the MJTF police. Now, the motto for the MJTF police is that they are the velvet glove on the iron fist. Anybody who is familiar with some of the speeches that have taken place, ex-President Reagan spoke in England here approximately two months ago and commented that the United Nations forces would be the velvet glove on the steel fist. 
This is a very popular phrase. It has been used extensively by these people that are within the New World Order operation. Notice these people, Reagan and others, talking about the steel fist with the velvet glove on it. It should be noted that most of the resources are being drawn again from federal fundings for regional governments. The state of Michigan converted part of their forces over on February 11th of 1989 when Senator Carl Lemon, the state adjutant generals of Michigan, Ohio, and Indiana met in Lansing and at 6.35 in the evening an agreement was struck in which elements of the Michigan National Guard would be deployed in Indiana and Ooh. Ohio. Notice they're using the wow. same idea, yes. taking them from Michigan, putting them in Indiana. Different, in different areas. In the event of, and in fact, it was stated that when firearms are confiscated in the Midwest, that these forces would be deployed both in Indiana and in Ohio. Indiana, Ohio would then provide 50% of its guard forces to police the Michigan area under the MJTF police guidelines. That, that way you get them out of their family networks and their friends. Approximately three months after the arrangement was made through the Department of Defense in conjunction with other agencies, some of them unknown at this time, the state of Indiana backed out of the agreement. When this took place, the federal government, through a series of funding coordinations, withdrew resources from the state of Indiana. They had to restructure part of their guard mechanism and in the process were able to maintain a good portion of their original integrity concerning their preparedness strength for guard forces. Three battalions had to be restructured at that time. Now the MJTF police are supplied and supported through strategic reserve aircraft that have been transferred to their resource. They will convert almost all of the existing local police agencies to national police forces after they have lifted personnel that they do not consider trustworthy and they will also incorporate street gangs. Now if anybody has seen the guidelines, and we have copies of both, this is Mark Kornke, the intelligence analyst speaking. The original stated that house-to-house -house search and seizures will be performed by military, law enforcement, and civilian personnel. Now we all know who the military are. That's anybody in a green uniform or a blue uniform with the Army, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard. We understand that those will be people in the National Guard Reserve and active military forces. We know who law enforcement is. These are the constables, the individuals that you have in your local level all the way up to any, including the secret police in the United States, such as the FBI, Central Intelligence Agency, and other agencies that might be at their disposal, Defense Intelligence Agency, etc. But who are the civilians that are going to come into your home? I don't recall there being any guidelines for that in the Constitution. The gangs. <clears throat> if anybody has listened to National Public Radio, you will note that on several different occasions, specifically the 10th month of 1992, it was announced that in fact there was a one-hour special program on National Public Radio about converting the street gangs to law enforcement agencies. Yep. We, did you see that or hear no, that? No, but I heard, I heard about it. You heard about it. Mm -hmm. That's interesting because we tried to locate it and they were not interested in letting us know that it ever happened. Yeah, we, we ran up against a dead end, but the fact that you heard it mm -hmm. is, is significant. We have been talking about this for years prior to its action. We knew that there were preparatory activities taking place. Through these activities, a truce was signed by most of the large gangs in the city of Los Angeles. Incidentally, these gangs are spreading. It's unbelievable how fast they are spreading. And that is a very significant development too. I heard that in Kansas, in one of the large cities there, a few years ago there were zero gangs. Now there's something like 84 gangs. Mm. A truce was signed by most of the large gangs in the city of Los Angeles. At the time, there were negotiations in progress in Chicago, and this was also taking place in New York. Since the initial action, a full agreement has been signed in Los Angeles, and both the Crips and the Bloods are now being trained, equipped, and uniformed mm. with federal funding through California. Wow. Uniformed, everything. Isn't that something? And I think this uh, firefighting business is just part of their work uh, yeah. for the federal government now. No doubt. Chicago has finalized this agreement last week. Now, why aren't we hearing about this on the news, John? Because they're the New World Order propaganda machine. New York is in the process of doing so sometime in the next few weeks, and we can assume that they will do this very quickly. These forces will be the cannon fodder, the Schutzenaufklärung. My German isn't the best. <laughs> Their mission is to be the forefront, the master forces to come through the door. Remember that the average federal agent makes anywhere from forty-seven to fifty-seven thousand dollars a year. He is more or less looking at his pension. He's not concerned with risking his life. 
especially if he can find someone to throw in front of him as a sandbag. That's the mission of these group forces that are being organized. Since last I spoke, probably the best example I'm sure that everybody listening here has heard about Waco, Texas. These forces that were on the ground, to give you the best example, were not effective fighting forces. When you retreat and leave wounded and dead lying on the ground, that's called a rout. That's not a retreat. And this is symptomatic of professional forces that are there for the money. On the other hand, if you use the old medieval pillage principle, and pay attention to this, pillage principle, and you have a profit mechanism set up in which you are allowed to confiscate properties, cars, jewelry, furniture, the neighbor's wife, whatever, then you are highly motivated to go through that door, if you're a criminal, of course, and especially if you have been doing it illegally for an extensive period of time and all of a sudden are given an opportunity to be legitimized. Now, I have here, John, Public Law 100-690, 100th Congress on the Coordination of National Drug Policy. Our drug policy allows the police agencies to confiscate, to f uh, under the forfeiture and seizure laws, to confiscate airplanes, houses, oh, I, land, yeah. property, and then they enrich their own agency mm -hmm. as a result. And this is some, these forfeiture and seizure laws were considered illegal for years and years, but under the RICO, the racketeering laws, they were brought back into America. We are seeing a revival of the medieval papal type of law code that enabled the, uh, the knights or whoever were enforcing things to seize things uh, from the people that they were attacking. This is also present in the um, wars against the Huguenots in France. Uh, if a person was a Protestant, they could be driven out of their property and the land seized by the person who drove them out. This is their reward, you see. And so this is the uh, profit mechanism that's being used. Remember, why would the street gang flourish the way it did? We had more, uh, more than the capability to restrict the street gangs at the time they came about. Most assuredly, we had the capacity to restrict them in any way that we wished to. However, by allowing the street gangs to flourish, you create regimentation. Then the strong come to the top. These are your NCOs and leaders. When you are finished, you simply put them in uniform and you have an organized military force at your disposal. Mm. They are thugs, but they are expendable thugs. Remember that. Now, remember how the BATF acted yes. down there. The, now, I've heard several commentators refer to them as thugs. Yes. Oh, yes. Now, MJTF police operations. There are several actions that have taken place within the last two years. Starting in 1991, they participated or were a part of Operation Achilles. Have you heard about that? No. It was a sweep from the southern Ohio Valley up through Michigan. ATF provided both the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and MJTF forces to harass and eliminate FFL holders who were manufacturers and producers of components mm -hmm. and arms. Mm -hmm. Their primary concern was not to confiscate or charge somebody with illegal arms, but rather to acquire records and resources that were available and in the hands of the people who held the FFL. That's a firearms trading license. So what they would do is come into an FFL location, a, a gun dealer, and seize his records, copy the records. They wanted to know who the gun owners were. Mm -hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. Why? I mean, these were people that had signed on the dotted line of the federal form and all. Why did they want that? Because of what's coming with the New World Order, with the, with the ultimate confiscation of the of They the want to know who's got what. That's right. In every case, they went into these businesses. The only thing that they took were the records of who purchased products and where they live. Very important to understand. Now, there are a series of other activities that took place after this. MJTF was deployed in Los Angeles during the L.A. riots though there was only a slight mention of it. That's the authority that they were under, along with FinCEN. All of these agencies are overlapping and under the general authority of the United Nations. Mm. Remember, we are now an international organization, not the United States. John, I have a uh, map here of the MJTF uh, police locations. They correspond quite similarly to the uh, detention facilities, or we might say concentration camp locations that we looked at. And these locations also include Florida, Georgia, uh, South Carolina, 
and uh, three in three locations in California. And then, so what are those? That's where the MJTF police uh, are located. Oh, okay. Uh, now, now, yes. Now uh, we have the FinCEN confirmed pre-deployment locations, and here we see a little difference in geography. We have. Uh, it's similar to the MJTF, but it also has a site here in New Mexico, several sites in Florida. Looks like one here in Orlando, probably Tampa. Uh, and then a, a whole string of them Around in Washington, the area up near Washington, sure. D.C. and in uh, the Carolinas and, uh, of course, Ohio. Bob, uh, where did you Indiana get Michigan. all this information? Well, uh, my good brother-in-law, Craig, has been digging it out wow. for us here for a number of weeks. Now, I'll just read to you, and I believe this is taken probably from Kornicke's material somewhere, uh, FinCEN mission is. Once again, it's house-to-house -house search and seizure of property and arms, separation and categorization of men, women, and children as prisoners in large numbers, transfer to detention facilities of aforementioned prisoners. FinCEN are foreign military and secret police brought into the United States for deployment against the U.S. citizens. Most identified FinCEN units are at company strength, 160 plus. Some are as large as brigade strength, 2,600 plus. All FinCEN equipment is black. FinCEN uniforms, helicopters, etc. And here we have United Nations combat groups confirmed locations. Four of them in Montana, you'll see. Wow. Two in California, one in Southern California, one up in, I think it's the Sacramento area. One in uh, New Mexico, one in Texas, one in Georgia, three here in uh, North Carolina, uh, some up here by New York City and up by Fort Drum in New York State and in Michigan. Wow. All right, these are confirmed locations for United Nations combat groups. Now, just yesterday, I was talking here to David Cooper, and he said when he was working next to Dulles Air Force Base, he knew that the Germans had an air base on our air base there, and the British did. And they were always flying in transport planes, almost continuously. Now, what does that mean? Bringing in stuff, huh? Tran bringing in stuff, sure. Uh, now, back to uh, Kornicke's uh, transcript here. And I'd like to throw in here also, John, that I got a call from a man, I think, uh, as I recall, he was a physician in California. He had just been on a trip to Washington, D.C. And he called me up and he said, Bob, what are all of these gold fringes around the flags? Every flag, he said, that we saw in Washington, D.C. at the Supreme Court, at the other government buildings, and all through the city had, had a gold fringe around the United States flag. He said, what does it mean? And I said, I don't know. I hadn't heard of such a thing hmm. before. Have you heard of such a thing? Well, I've <laughs> seen gold fringes on flags many times. Yeah, this, uh, but this, what was unusual was all of them that he saw had this gold in fringe Washington, in Washington, D.C. Huh. And so... Well, just, just recently? Yes. And so uh, our research turned up that this stands for monarchical or corporate control of the United States and uh, for the new emerging United States that is part of the UN scenario and that is no longer oriented primarily to the Constitution but it's more oriented to UN law, this type I, of thing. I want to say one thing to our, to our viewers. They, mm. You can look at this stuff and discredit it and laugh and say we're alarmist and um, try to discredit the things that are being said but when you look if you will just step back and allow yourself to look at this entire situation, this entire video, and just little by little put the pieces together with spiritual discernment from the Lord's Holy Spirit, you'll be able to see a pattern here, folks. So, you know, spiritual things are spiritually discerned, Bob. Well, I'd like to say something along that score, John, and I was originally planning to say something about that at the beginning of this video. Uh, I have had information coming across my desk for years, for instance, about the different regions in the United States and how the New World Order had carved up the United States into ten regions. 
And I kind of dismissed it. I, I knew it was there. I didn't know what for sure to make of it or what would ever come of it. It sounded harebrained. Yeah. Somebody in some dusty sure. room somewhere had dreamed this That's stuff right. up. It didn't have any significance. But now I know about the Bilderbergers, the Club of Rome, the CFR, the Milner Group. And by the way, John, I have here... Uh, the what you're saying, Bob, is that you don't dis well, you don't discount it like no, you used to. No, you don't laugh at this stuff like because you used we've to. got the reality of it yeah. in front of us, and one of the most striking realities. We're going to come to the Lord willing at the end of this tape, where we look in detail at Waco and at the Randy Weaver case, because these are two cases in point which dramatize in real life for us the fact that people are dead today yeah. because of what we're talking about, and. Uh, <sighs> We, I, I am not usually a person to jump on something first time I see it. I mean, some of this stuff has been accumulating. Yeah. Uh, I've been exposed to it for years and years. A lot of the rest of it is new right now. But the, the, what I'm driving at, did you have something, John? I'm just going to ask you, what do you say to our <coughs> viewers and supporters to their friends who scoff at them? Okay, all right, stuff? that's what I'm getting to. Our first... What we're dealing with here is the perception of reality. How do you perce perceive reality? How do you arrive at the truth of what is happening? First of all, we have the Bible. And that is the, the Word of God. We have prophecy which tells us what is going to happen. We know what's going to happen. That there's going to be uh, the, uh, the ten horns will give their power as kings for one hour with the beast. We've talked about that in other videos. We know what's going to happen to the United States from Revelation 13. We have the book Great Controversy, which elaborates in quite a bit of detail the broad lucky picture of it. we are to be Seventh-day yes, Adventists to yes. have this well, well, magnifying we, glass of the spirit of right. prophecy. Craig uncovered a lady who for 15 years has been trying to tell the world that the Vatican is at the bottom of all of this mm -hmm. stuff. And he talked to her in, her in his first conversation, and he said, have you ever heard of the book Great Controversy? She said, I've got two copies of it right here. Bless her heart. She said, this lady painted the picture in broad features. I'm just filling in the details. And she says, the Knights of Malta are at the bottom and at the center of this whole thing. And we, we've talked, of course, about William Casey being a Knight of sure. Malta. But First, our per first perception is that our reality has to be perceived, first of all, from the Word of God. And 1 Corinthians chapter 2 tells us how we know things. The science of knowing is the science of epistemology. And Locke and other uh, philosophers believe that a person acquires knowledge solely through the sensory perceptions. Immanuel Kant came along and wrote his critique of pure reason. He said, no, that's not the way. The way you acquire knowledge is that it is already inherently stamped upon your brain and you have to listen to your intuition. But the fact of the matter is, according to 1 Corinthians 2, the way you ac acquire knowledge, true knowledge, the knowledge of God, is through the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's, Christianity is a revealed Amen. religion. I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God, God hath prepared for them, them that, love that love him. But God hath revealed those things to us through the Spirit. Amen. And only the Spirit searcheth the deep things of God. So to really know reality, you have to have the Holy Spirit. Now, to perceive what's happening in the signs of the times, first we have to go to inspiration. And that has to be our preconception, our, our, our uh, presuppositional base, the grid through which we look at everything. Because everybody has a presuppositional sure. base. Some people's ha people have humanistic, uh, or worldly, or materialistic, or spiritualistic, or whatever. But the Word of God has to be our presuppositional grid through which, like the glasses, through which we view everything. All right, that's first and foremost. And then the Holy Spirit has to lead us in uncovering the reality of the signs of the times. What, what is really happening now? I just figured we we uh, needed to say that right oh, there, Bob. Absolutely, there are things this that is, people just ah, you know, no. scoff at. No, this is very important. This is so important. I'm glad you brought it up, John. Well, the last thing we talked about now was the gold fringe around the flags yeah, and what, it, yeah. what, what you've uncovered yeah, that, yeah. That, that that means. Yeah. Before we get back to that, I just want to mention, when I was in college, I remember his history teachers scoffing, at least a, a certain academy history teacher who had just graduated from college, scoffing at the idea of conspiracy theories. Yes. 
Well, Ellen White is very clear that there is a conspiracy. It's you the Vatican. I believe there is. And yeah. now we know from Carol Quigley, the mentor of Bill Clinton, that there, we know the people, who they are. Here is the Anglo-American establishment by Carol Quigley, who taught at Georgetown University in which he de delineates the personalities involved in Cecil Rhodes' establishment of the roundtable groups, which was a Jesuit-style pattern after the constitutions of the Jesuits, which we've talked about in other videos. You talk about people who scoff at conspiracies. I want to tell you, Bob, that the majority of the people, I believe, you correct me if I'm wrong, the majority of the people who are involved in this conspiracy in the world to take over the world of the new world government with the uh, with with the new the, the new world order, may not even be cognizant of the fact that they are part of the conspiracy. At the highest levels, they are very at, aware at of it. At the though. highest levels, yeah. but but the in the but, lower levels, but the lower levels, yeah. they are not even aware that they are part That's of right. the conspiracy. That's, right. That's why today the same thing with the corporate structure of the Seventh Day Adventist corporate structure mm -hmm. is that the pastors and those who are in the lower echelon they laugh and mm -hmm. scoff at any type of conspiracy theory about a takeover uh, of our. De denominational organization mm -hmm. and they don't even know that they are a part of that conspiracy. But let me tell you John, in the days of Wiley and Daubigny and these other men that uh, Ellen White read when she was writing Great Controversy, they were very aware of the conspiracy of the papacy to take over England, to take over other nations. I mean this is a very old concept and a very well understood concept by them and one of the reasons America and our structure has fallen into the trap it has is because they no longer understand the forces of evil that are at work to try to take over. Talking about the entities. forces of evil I want the viewers to know that if you hear things rumbling and shaking I want you to know that the wind is whipping around this building <laughs> unbelievably today it is dark overcast the wind is blowing and we can just hear it just whipping around this building and when you t it seems like every time we tape Bob there's a storm <laughs> isn't that amazing I, I see a, a great application there now I would like to read something here John we've talked a little bit about these MJTF police, and we're going to get back to it, and the FinCEN and uh, takeover by the uh, New World Order. But here is what the mentor of Bill Clinton said. Now remember, he sat at this man's feet, and this man was his mentor at Georgetown. He's talking about the future in perspective and what's going to happen to the democracies. Now, you know that the perspective of Rome is that America is as. I mean, that's, it's just an infant as far as time goes. 200 years of democracy is uh, nothing compared to the hundreds and hundreds of years that Rome ruled the world. Well, listen to this on page 1200 of Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time by Carol Quigley, the mentor of Bill Clinton. When weapons are of the amateur type of 1880, as they were in Greece in the 5th century, they are widely possessed by citizens Power is similarly dispersed, and no minority can compel the majority to yield to its will. With such an amateur we weapons system, if other conditions are not totally unfavorable, we are likely to find majority rule and a relatively democratic political system. But on the contrary, when a period can be dominated by complex and expensive weapons that only a few persons can afford to possess or can learn to use, we have a situation where the minority who control such specialist weapons can dominate the majority who lack them. That's right. And that's what we have now. I mean, we're, here we've got tanks, we've got, you know, stealth bombers. When all I stuff. saw, when I have, <clears throat> what actual video I have seen of the German Jewish Holocaust, when we would see thousands and thousands of Jews who knew they were walking to their death. They knew they were walking to death. They knew that they were either going to be gassed or they knew that they were going to be uh, machine gunned. And there would just be a few German soldiers with machine guns and thousands of Jews. And, Millions. And, and, and you say to yourself, if they, just, if they just ran towards the Germans, yes, some of them would get it, but they could overpower them. But there is this same thing that you're just talking about, that a few people with guns can, can have control over thousands. And that's why we're seeing all of this gun control. By the way, John, I want to show you a very, very important document that has uh, emerged just recently. 
Bob, I, I hope you don't get upset with me because I keep comparing this to the, to the structure, but I see these new theology pastors <laughs> that, that absolutely <laughs> demand control of, of the church and a whole church against them almost <laughs> and the people writing us and calling us on the phone and weeping and a, a, a one one strong-willed new theology pastor can go in and destroy destroy a what was a historic Adventist church and turn it around. And I am just amazed at the people who are willing, like the Jews, to lay down. It's like they're outgunned by they're NLP. They're outgunned. You know? Yeah. you know, these guys are, that, I'm they're, glad you said that, they're NLP trained. Yeah. They're taking control. Psychological warfare. It's psychological warfare. They are they are so overpowering is. the pe people's minds. The people feel like they have they are no match mm -hmm. for these NLP trained pastors, mm -hmm. and they just they just they just just like when they were machine gunning the Jews in, in front of the trenches. I, that's the way I feel that our historic Adventist people are being treated by these NLP trained pastors. And if it gets to be too much for the pastor, they bring in the evangelist oh. who will blast the historic Adventists yeah. and tell them the most amazing thing. Uh, along this line of psychological warfare now, this is this affidavit which reads, I, Oliver Kenneth Goff, was a member of the Communist Party and the Young Communist League from May 2, 1936 to October 9, 1939. During this period of time, I operated under the alias of John Keats and the number 18B2. My testimony before the government is incorporated in Volume 9 of the Un-American Activities Report for the year 1939. While a member of the Communist Party, I attended Communist underground training schools outside the city of New York, in the Booze Hall and in 113 East Wells Street, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The East Wells Street School operated under the name of the Eugene Debs School. Here, under the tutoring of Eugene Dennis, M. Sparks, Morris Childs, Jack Kling, and others, we were schooled in the art of revolutionary overthrow of the established government. We were trained uh, to know how to di dismantle and assemble mimeograph machines to use for propaganda purposes during the revolution, how to work on guide wires and fuel lines of airplanes so that they would either burst into flames or crash to the ground because of lack of control, how to work on ties and rails to wreck trains, and also the art of poisoning water supplies. And now here's the critical paragraph. We discussed quite thoroughly the fluoridation of water supplies and how we were using it in Russia as a tranquilizer in the prison camps. The leaders of our school felt that if it could be induced into the American water supply, it would bring about a spirit of lethargy in the nation, where wow. it would keep the general public docile during a steady encroachment of communism. Have you ever wow. heard of the fluorid, uh, putting, Flu introducing fluorides into the water? Of Fluoridation the water system, of water. Sure. We also discussed the fact that keeping a store of deadly fluoride near the water reservoir would be advantageous during the time of the revolution as it would give us opportunity to dump this poison into the water supply and either kill off the populace or threaten them with liquidation so that they would surrender to obtain fresh water. We discussed in these schools the complete art of revolution, the seizure of the main utilities such as light power, gas and water, but it was felt by the leadership that if a program of fluoridating of the water could be carried out in the nation, it would go a long way toward the advancement of the revolution. The above statements are true, Oliver Kenneth Goff, and it's all duly notarized. Wow. Very interesting, isn't it? And, uh, you know, toothpaste all had to have fluoride in yeah. it, and the dentist recommended this. Uh, another very important document along the line of what we're talking about here with the uh, uh, mentor of uh, Bill Clinton, Carol Quigley, is a book that has just come out entitled Gun Control, Gateway to Tyranny. And what this amazing document contains is the Nazi Weapons Law, 18 March 1938, the original German text and translation with an analysis that shows that U.S. gun control laws have Nazi roots by J. Simpkin and Aaron Zellman. Uh, this has the text right in German and uh, a translation of the text. It has then a side-by-side -side, uh, translation of the German text and on the opposite page, the uh, 1968, notice right after Vatican II, 19, do you notice how many things happened after Vatican II? Right there at the beginning of the 60s, it's amazing at what took place. 
And on the right side, it has the 1968 gun control law. Now they know, and the documentation is in here, that um, the man who, uh, Thomas Dodd, the congressman who uh, developed and designed the U.S. gun control law, had a copy of the Nazi gun control law, and he had it had it translated by the Library of Congress, and they have the statement in here, right here, is the Library of Congress um, note to Honorable Thomas J. Dodd, Chairman of Special Subcommittee to Investigate Juvenile Delinquency. Dear Senator Dodd, your request of July 2, 1968, addressed to the Legislative Reference Service for the translation of several German laws has been referred to in the Law Library for attention. In compliance with your request and with reference to several telephone conversations between Ms. Frank of your office and Mr. Fred Karf, European Law Division, we are enclosing herewith a translation of the Law on Weapons of March 18, 1938, prepared by Dr. William Solyom Fakety of that division, as well as the Xerox copy of the original German text which you supplied. The translation of the decree implementing the law on weapons of March 19, 1938 and the pertinent provisions of the federal hunting law of March 30, 1961 is in preparation and will be sent to you as soon as contemplated. Sincerely yours, Louis C. Coffin, Law Librarian. And what happened was four months after this, out comes the U.S. weapons law pattern precisely on the Nazi weapons law where Hitler removed the guns from the uh, German people so they could control the populations en masse. Bob, you talked about all the things, and just in, this, in the first part of this video that we've been talking thus far, about all the things that happened at the, at, at the turn of the decade, of the, the beginning of the 60s. There was a, there was a, a paradigm shift, as you say, uh, that took place in the world Right at Vatican II, there at the, and right just, after it. Uh, right, just before and right after, right there at the, at the uh, 1961, 62, right in there. I cannot help but see the parallel of what has happened in the corporate structure in the beginning of the 90s. Mm -hmm. 91, 90, 91, 92, 93. In those beginning years, we have seen celebration. Mm -hmm. We have seen NLP. We have seen a, a, a exact Jesuit agenda being followed. We have seen all of these things that have been a total shift of everything we have believed before right there in that have happened suddenly. And I can't help but think and see the parallel between what happened in the early 60s in the United States being what happened in the early 90s mm -hmm. in the Seventh Avenue's corporate structure. And in Jesuit Agenda 1, we traced what was happening during, right after Vatican II in our structure that laid the groundwork yes. for what's happening now in yes. the 90s. It's just like that they have been preparing for years and years and years, getting everything ready, getting everything into line, and then suddenly when they strike, it's quick. That's right. Boy, it's happened suddenly. I mean, celebration came on us like a whirlwind, Bob. That's right. Like a whirlwind. That's right. That's right. They have a quotation in here by Adolf Hitler. August 22, 1939, he said, I have given orders to my death units to exterminate without mercy or pity men, women, and children belonging to the Polish-speaking race. It is only in this manner that we can acquire the vital territory which we need. After all, who remembers today the extermination of the Armenians? Well, the Armenians, 1.5 million of them were slaughtered by the Turks in World War I. They were marched on death marches. They were forbidden to have any arms, and therefore a few soldiers could take them off and exterminate them. But we are seeing the Nazi gun control legislation that came in to our legislation in 1968. And the way Hitler worked was he removed first this part of the weapons that the people had, then this part. They just chipped away, chipped away. They required registration. Then th when they knew who, who had the firearms, then they would confiscate and that type of thing. So we're looking at the same procedure now. And back to Carol Quigley talking about this society where specialist weapons can dominate the majority who lack them, a, minor a minority that controls specialist weapons can dominate the majority who lack them. In such a society, he writes, sooner or later, an authoritarian political system that reflects the inequality in control of weapons will be established. In other words, democracy will go. Mm. And authoritarian political systems. Now, a most amazing paragraph 
two paragraphs here. At the present time, there seems to be little reason to doubt that the specialist weapons of today will continue to dominate the military picture into the foreseeable future. If so, there is little reason to doubt that authoritarian rather than democratic political regimes will dominate the world into the same foreseeable future. To be sure, traditions and other factors may keep democratic systems or at least democratic forms in many areas such as the United States or England. To us, brought up as we were on a democratic ideology, this may seem very tragic, but a number of perhaps redeeming features in this situation may well be considered. For one, our society, Western civilization, is almost 1,500 years old and was democratic in political action for less than 200 of these years, or even half of that in strict truth. A period that is not democratic in its political structure is not necessarily bad, he says. And so, basically what he's saying, and this is a mentor of Bill Clinton, we're moving from democracy to authoritarianism. Mm. And that's the way it's going to be. Now, back to this uh, transcript. In 1992 through early 1993, reorganization was taking place to try and give the MJTF greater credibility. However, it was understood that the mercenary forces probably will not function as originally anticipated, so the Guard has been restructured. That, for many people who are familiar with the way the Guard operates, will understand why the Guard is being rifted of experienced personnel. Desert dust, or in other words, we call it desert storm. Its mm. primary mission was threefold, but its primary mission was to see whether or not the American people would eat the New World Order. U.S. soldiers were sent overseas, their American flags were taken off their uniforms, flags were taken down by officers in the field because the flag was not allowed to be flown. U.N. flag. Mo it, it had to be it the U.N. flag. Be the UN yeah, flag. Right. Most every other, na wait a minute though, most every other nationality was allowed to fly their flag. Except the U.S. And Isn't that other, amazing? other than for publicity purposes, for public consumption, the general position was that the flag was to be trodden at every opportunity. If any of you were watching the news, you noticed that a lot of Marines were jumping up and showing their patch, which they had just pulled out of their pocket, and laying it on their arm and going, see this? This is what I'm fighting for, showing the American flag that they had been required to take off their uniform. These people have to be done away with. You can't have these people in the military, Cornkey is saying. And so they decided that they would have to rift these people out, transfer them to the guard if they are already in guard units, restructure, reestablish guidelines that would allow them to extract these people from the mechanism. They are trying to go to the next generation with educated idiots. They are looking for people who are going to be more pliable. As Mr. Rockefeller said many years ago, clay that can be molded more efficiently. And since the first or latest crop didn't work, we are now going to restructure the entire mechanism and see what we can get from the next batch. This is where we are going with this. Now it should be noted that before they can do all of this, before they can perform any of the actions that are pending, they are going to have to take the weapons that we have inside the United States. I will say again that the meeting that took place in 1989, the federal government, the representatives that were there stated uncategorically when we take the weapons, not if we take the weapons, but when. And under that premise, everything else was constructed. Now very quickly, there is one that I like here. I'm going to have it put up on the board and he shows a poster of Hitler doing the Heil Hitler salute. Everybody, everybody in favor of gun control, please raise your right hand. And then he tells about this book, uh, Gun Control Act of 1968, uh, in which it has been demonstrated that the Gun Control Act of 1968 wasn't simply an American creation. It was taken from Nazi Germany's gun control laws of 1938 word for word. Now that's very important when you consider this because we're not talking a few paragraphs here and there. The entire document is taken from Nazi Germany's gun control laws of 1938. Mm. If they were already at that level in 1968, then where are you going to go with our gun laws now? It should be understood that the MJTF police is not trusted by the federal agencies and eventually will be done away with. Again, the MJTF are useful cannon fodder that will eventually be swept to the side. Moving on beyond the MJTF police, and we're going to back up to them, going back to them in a little bit, are the FinCEN forces. FinCEN, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network Personnel. FinCEN has as much to do with finances as the SAS had to do with airplanes. The SAS, Special Air Service, is a cover name for an entity that existed in England and was the equivalent to the OSS of World War II, 1941 to 45. FinCEN forces, their primary mission is house-to-house -house searches and seizure 
separation and categorization of men, women, and children, transfer to detention facilities, securing properties acquired, but not the maintaining of detention camps. That will be the mission of the MJTF police. I should mention very quickly the detention camps themselves. Originally under FEMA, 23 detention camps were authorized. These detention camps are spread out across the United States. In addition to that, there are 20 supplemental camps that were authorized with the 1990-1991 military fiscal budget. Carl Levin's DOD budget amendment 656 authorized the implementation of these 20 camps to supplement the 23 that were already authorized. There are now 43 total camps that are pre-deployed inside the continental United States. And then he lists some of them. In addition to that, there are supplemental camps or auxiliary camps through each state and in each region. An example of this would be the Nike Hercules site located near Monroe. That is a pre-designated detention facility. The three sites that are located in Michigan, number one is located north of Pinckney, Michigan and due west of Brighton. Second is earmarked near Lansing, Michigan, north, northeast. The third is Fort Custer Military Reservation, which has been upgraded from a D facility to a B facility. This is very important because a D facility is state authorized and state controlled. A B facility, on the other hand, has been upgraded to federal status and is comparable in, uh, to any of our, for instance, prime military facilities, such as Fort Benning, Georgia, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, any facility that we are presently using for active military forces. And then he tells of, of what is going on in these places. However, if you get a chance to tour the highways and byways and back roads of Fort Custer, you will find that there is a new urban warfare center there. The new urban warfare center does not look like Bad Hirschfeld, Germany. It looks like downtown Monroe. It looks like downtown uh, Salina. It has three bedroom ranch style houses, cracker box farmhouses, small living areas inside downtown areas. At this particular site, MJTF police forces were training from the first week of January 1989 on. They were training every second and third week of the month from Monday through Thursday. They were uh, paying with non-Department -de of Defense funds. In other words, there were uh, GSA or they were funds from another agency other than regular military budget allocation. How does he substantiate all this, Bob? Well, he's a military intelligence <laughs> briefing officer. Well, he I mean, what, he what? has a team all across America that feeds him information, you see. And this is the way these military briefings go. We have eight tapes of his. D and I've only listened I to mean, about two of them. He better be able to back all this stuff up because, man, people can just take him mm. to the cleaners. We'll get back to FinCEN now. FinCEN was organized utilizing foreign military forces and secret police forces here in the United States. They are drawn from military and secret police forces overseas. They were, are predominantly European. We have Belgian, Dutch, German. We're looking at French. We also have a variety of Asian military personnel. It is known at this time, for instance, that FinCEN has an element in Montana that is made up of Gurkhas. The 197th mechanized, as of one week ago, has deployed for a training operation that may last for as long as two months in northern Montana through the Canadian frontier. It is the 197th mechanized infantry combined with two brigades of British mechanized infantry, the 1st Canadian Armored Division, Gurkha Mercenary Forces, one Belgian brigade, one EEC mixed security brigade and an undetermined number of other forces, all foreign. Now, when this man worked for, uh, as a military analyst in the military and as a counter uh, intelligence coordinator, it was his job all day long to assess military information. He read journals, he read reports. I mean, this is what he did all day mm -hmm. long. And he is basically utilizing these skills now to explain what is happening in the setup uh, for the New World Order. They originally were scheduled to work for approximately three weeks in the area, but if this is similar to the last mobilization that took place, you will find that they will be there for up to two and a half to three months. During the LA crisis that took place, there were a series of actions that took place both in Montana. We also saw activities in California, and there were activities in northern Texas in the Panhandle. FinCEN forces are ruthless. The Gurkha, for an example, the Gurkhas are professional mercenary forces from Nepal. They ro rotate these forces for a period of time out of Nepal and were originally hired by the British military force for a number of years. Now that they are under UN authority, of course, we have to find a use for them, and they have. And, uh, he tells us about regionalism. 
Now, those who have studied about the New World Order know that the United States is divided up into ten regions. Um, we have a very interesting thing about how they are training the children to think in terms of regions rather than states. On the back of the Kix cereal boxes, for example, now, they have the regions of the United States and they have the UN insignia and nowhere does it say anything about the United States. This it is on just the back of the Kix, Kix kids box. cereal? Yes. Well, we're finding that the cartoon characters, they're using UN type persons and people who have AIDS and all this, there is a tremendous conditioning that's going on with the children in uh, Well, if we can get uh, our hands on that, we'll show it to our Well, viewers. we have it uh, somewhere, but I, I don't think we'll, we'll try to get our hands on it and insert this into, into the yeah. video, but this is incredible. Yeah, the different regions. Yeah. And they, they do it very, uh, in, in very subtly and in sure. a very nice way. You know, in this region, you have these kind of uh, products that are produced and all, but it's still the s same ten regions of the New and World instead Order. Of, instead of showing the 50 states, they show the ten regions. Yes. Well, they, they show the ten regions superimposed on the Isn't states in that, different colors. Isn't that something? Wild. Yeah, I have been absolutely amazed at the conditioning that is going on with, with children. We were in a uh, pizza hut and saw a, uh, a comic book that they had for children with all kinds of spiritualistic concepts, just loaded with spiritualistic concepts. And it was this Professor Xavier who has all of these mutants that they're going to enforce peace on the earth and they're going to enforce love and unity and they're hated by the people of Earth, but they have a wonderful mission to accomplish to impose love and unity and peace on the inhabitants of the Earth, Earth. And they use all kinds of psychological and supernatural spiritualistic forces to accomplish this. Well, this is what the kids are growing up with now instead of the Bible and instead of Moses and Elijah and the great stories of the Bible, this is what they're growing up with. They, there is a generation, the point is, there is a generation that is being conditioned for all of this. Amen. I will use the regional map here, Kornke says. There are a number of forces spread throughout the ten regions. For those of you who are not familiar with regionalism, regionalism is a form of government that we are about to experience if the New World Order people have their way. Under regionalism, Michigan becomes not Michigan, but Area 5. As Area 5, our capital will be in Chicago. Under the new state's constitution, this particular type of government comes into power and we're going to find all of a sudden we are part of this warm, fuzzy new world order real <laughs> quick. Unfortunately, we never vote for a governor again. Note, there goes republicanism. The governor will be directly assigned by the president, kind of like in Star Wars. You know, I'm amazed at how, what impact the media has had. When we were researching NLP, we found a book written by a couple of army officers where they told of a Jedi project in the military that used NLP. They have been using NLP in, in the military for years and they ta have taken a lot of their cues from Star Wars. Mm -hmm. This is absolutely astounding. I would like to emphasize that this is a counterintelligence military style briefing by Kornicke, which means that we don't have books that document these things. These are sightings that people report to him. This is intelligence that he's gathered. For instance, if you gain some information in intelligence based on a visual observation of something, what documentation do you have other than that person's uh, testimony? So we have to realize that the evaluation that we have to put on this. This is a counterintelligence briefing by a an expert who is analyzing what you he sees happening. You know what's happening. amazing to me, Bob, <clears throat> is those who claim that they love and support independent ministries and that they are, quote, our friends, who try to take us apart with these things. I am amazed at, at those who, who say that they appreciate what we're doing, but, and then they try to undo what the, the, the work that we are doing and the work that you are doing and the stuff that you have un, uncovered and have shown. And 
I, I can't I, I can't believe that these people are really our friends. You know, they, they mm. claim to be our friends, they claim to be historic Adventists, but yet they do everything they possibly can to undermine the work that we are doing. Mm. Well, I like to say this, John, that when you're dealing with intelligence, and I think any independent ministry that has has tried to verify things and document things. There's various ways you can document things. You can document things because it's in a book. Just because it's in a book doesn't always necessarily mean, necessarily mean that it is absolutely verifiable, you know. Right. Uh, it tells you where your source is from. In a court of law, they like to have witnesses because witnesses have seen something. They testify before the jury and before the judge and the attorneys that are present regarding what they have seen. And then counter witnesses, you know, will testify what they saw that was a little bit different. So uh, I want the people to bear in mind that this is a military style counterintelligence briefing that this man's team has assembled regarding what they have witnessed, what they have seen, what they have been able to verify across the nation. And but he doesn't give sources like so and so saw this because that person would be in trouble. Yeah. So if this video is just like the other videos that we have done together and to where, to where the viewer is the jury. We are presenting the material. Yeah. You come to your own conclusion. And see, I could leave this kind of evidence out and just uh, stick with things from books or newspapers, but I feel that this is an important line of evidence that needs to be considered on the merits of the fact that this is an intelligence analyst that has put this together with his team regarding what they understand is happening now in America. I would like to also say that on that kicks box, the basic conditioning process that we're seeing there with the children is the concept of regionalism. There is a slightly different redrawing of the lines than in the New World Order, but the concept of regionalism is what's conveyed. The kids are getting, so they think that way. And it's been said, give me the next generation, you know, and I've got the world, I've got the, uh, I'll have the whole world changed. Now he tells about, I'm going to just breeze through and hit a few high points now because uh, I don't want to, to read here too much, but he tells of the U.S. forces that are overseas. We have forces in uh, 20 to 21,000 sitting off of Yugoslavia's coast or in Yugoslavia now. We have approximately 20,000 mixed personnel functioning in Somalia. Uh, that's 40,000 there. Then we have 20 to 23, 22 to 23,000 in Cambodia. And during Desert Storm, 18,000 military personnel were sent to Peru. While everyone was watching what was happening over here in Kuwait, 18,000 were sent down into Peru. So we've got about 80,000 stationed overseas right now. The, now he tells about the amount of force that is facing the American people, approximately the equivalent to several heavy infantry divisions, he says, with a couple mixed mechanized divisions combined. We're looking at a little over 300,000 personnel that we can verify or that we can at least identify in different parts of the country. These forces include FinCEN elements through Montana, North, Northern Cal California, Southern California, Central Texas, the northern part of North Carolina, Fort Drum, the eastern seaboard, including elements that are now stationed around the capital of the United States, Washington, D.C. There are five FinCEN companies deployed there. Now about UN combat forces. Uh, he says UN nations combat, United Nations combat forces include those that are cooperating with FinCEN at this time in Montana. The elements that are in California, there are 21,000 of them identified south of Los Angeles and are probably deployed north, northeast of Los Angeles in the Sacramento Basin. The elements that were located in Texas have shifted by all indications and are probably spread out through a series of garrisons. The Ohio Valley, starting in the Cincinnati area and moving north, northwest, have forces deployed there. We know that these elements are also located uh, in a, a certain fort that I couldn't uh, detect from the tape, the, the accurate name. And then there are some in Fort Benning, Georgia, and in Fort Drum. Uh, the processing center for detainees in the western half of the United States is Oklahoma City. We do not know what the location is for the eastern seaboard at this time. However, by all indications, Fort Drum will be the control point for processing individuals to detention facilities on the eastern half of the United States, east of the Mississippi. And then he tells about the rotary wing aircraft assets of FinCEN. That's the helicopters. 
Back in the early part of 1990, approximately 3,000 rotary wing aircraft were withdrawn from our strategic reserve. They are not from the reserve or guard. They came from the mothball fleet. Upon implementing the force, these units were transferred to FinCEN, painted in the flat black, not the flat green. They bear no markings or ID to determine whether they are American or foreign nationals. The fact of the matter is they are now foreign national assets. They are no longer in the hands of the United, Air, United States Air Force. FinCEN, utilizing these rotary wing assets, have both heavy lift aircraft and conventional attack aircraft. The heavy aircraft, which have been experienced in the area in which I am speaking right now, are the Chinook, the H-47s. It has a rotor front and rear and can carry up to 64 personnel in one lift. The first mission for FinCEN helicopter and support aircraft is to go in and actually control ground operations. They do not have to follow roads. They are not concerned with roadblocks, obstructions, infrastructure damage, etc. They can drop into an area, insert military forces, utilize those forces to the best of their ability, and if they are needed somewhere else, lift and move them again. I want to say something else about this, uh, the uh, analyst, the military analyst that is speaking here. Uh, our researcher, Craig, talked to a, uh, a literature professor at the University of, Ontario, uh, of Toronto who is skilled in uh, analyzing whether things are forgeries or whether things are genuine. And he said instantly, he had seen this video, and he said he knew instantly it was a genuine uh, thing that was transpiring here, that this was a, 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 not a, a bogus type of, of, uh, of a lecture let, that was let, going on. Let, let me ask you a question, Bob. This sounds so far-fetched to some people. If we had been living in Germany in 1936 and somebody had told us what was going to happen in the next five years in Germany, would any German alive have believed no. what was being organized and what was taking place within the government of Germany if somebody, if, some, if somebody had prophetically told them what was being orchestrated, what conspiracy was being formed, what was going to happen to the German nation and the world, what the German people were going to do, what they were going to lose. You think there was a German anywhere outside of those in the highest ech echelons of the party who would have believed if somebody had told them. They'd have said, you are a wild-eyed fanatic, you are a nut, that is impossible, that will never happen, and they would have run, out, run them out of town on a, on a rail. That's true, and yet they had Mein Kampf. They knew the plan. It was laid out, but no one really believed that it would happen. You see, it's just like this. And it was published in the West, and the West didn't believe it would really happen. Do you know that we published in Freedom's Ring the testimony of Albert Speer, who, when he was on trial at Nuremberg, uh, told of uh, his experience of how he was in his office one day and an old friend, military man, came in and started to tell him that he needed to go and see this place called Auschwitz and see what was going on there. And he said, I didn't want to hear anything about it. I didn't want to go. I just, basically, he stuck his head in the sand. He didn't want to hear about it. It was so overpowering, and he didn't want to believe that anything like that was going on. Here he was in the highest echelons of Hitler's government. And when he is approached regarding what is happening in Poland, in the concentration camps, he doesn't want to believe it. Once again, I bring in the parallel of exactly what's happening with our people in, in our country is what's happening to the people in the Seventh-day Adventist corporate structure. They do, they're in denial, they do not want to believe that this stuff is going on. They say, I don't want to see those videos, I will not look at them, I do not want to hear those audio tapes, I don't want to read that magazine, I don't want to have anything to do with that, no, get away from me, I don't want to, that's exactly the attitude that our historic Adventist people are receiving from their professed Adventist friends. They don't want to hear it. They're in absolute denial that any of this stuff could be going on in the corporate structure. That's a very good analogy, John. And I'll say this, that unless a person has a different point of reference than what they see with their eyes, namely, unless they have the reference point of faith in the Word of God, they're going to have difficulty, great difficulty, in coming to grips with what is happening because their point of reference is the structure, so they have no way of evaluating what's going on in the structure as to rightness, the rightness or wrongness of right. it because they're not reading and studying. 
Now, even those of us who have read and studied have been in shock at what's going on. I remember telling someone recently that when we started going out and speaking and warning people about the theological developments. Now, I had been watching this taking place at the seminary for years. I had watched and I knew what was going on. I was deeply alarmed. I knew we were heading into a very difficult situation. In our, in our church. And yet when we actually went out and started speaking about it, I remember turning to my wife in the car as we were driving and saying, is it really possible that these things are happening? Is it really true? And then I would think, absolutely. It's all documented. I've got it in black and white. It's all there. It is reality. But you see, this is the problem people have when there are marked, subtle, but rapid and powerful changes taking place People have difficulty coming to grips, and some, many people will just go into a state of denial. It's far easier than facing the reality of what is happening. And when you first get the, when, when you, we know we have a new age, new world order president and vice president, John. We have, I have a book here entitled The New Covenant of Bill Clinton and Al Gore, Neo-Pagan Fundamentalism and the New Politics by John Barella. It lays out the picture of the occult spiritualism of, of our administration. It is absolutely shocking. But most and, people don't want to come to grips with it. And you see, this. this has been brought in to take the place of what we've always had of our Constitution. Right. There is a new covenant. See, that's, that, that's what it says, the new covenant. This right. is the new American Constitution that yeah. is coming in to take the place of what we have always yeah. stood on as the foundation of our freedom. Yeah. But, uh, we, the same thing in the corporate structure. Just yesterday, you see, we have always based our beliefs on the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. That has been the foundation. That's been the, the Constitution of the Seventh-day Adventist Church right. has been the, the, our, our best bedrock of security, okay. the bedrock of our freedom and existence has been the Bible mm -hmm. and the spirit of prophecy. But suddenly we have a new covenant coming in, a new constitution, a new bedrock, a new foundation for the corporate structure and it's the church manual. Just yesterday three people testified to me, we can back it up, their Seventh Adventist pastor said to them that the church manual is on the same level as the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. The church manual is inspired of God and on the same level of inspiration and thus saith the Lord as the Bible and the spirit of prophecy because it is written by men under the control of God who are the highest authority on earth. And Amen. that's what the conference pastors are telling our people. And you see, our people don't know how to rebut that. If they're not reading and studying, they just accept it. Just like the people in the United States are accepting this new Bill Clinton, New Covenant, Al, Al Gore, New Covenant, these new, this New Age president that we've got. Uh, the people are accepting it. They're accepting the, 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 the tearing down of the, old, of the old platform and this new thing coming in. And our people, our, his, our Adventist people who are not reading and studying are accepting this new theology that is just waffing over our denomination like a tidal wave and accepting now the church manual as the new standard and the bedrock for our foundation of us as a people. That's Catholic, of, the principle of Catholicism, pure and simple, that you have another authority besides inspiration. Yes. Uh, it, uh, Catholicism puts oral tradition on a par with the, yes. with the scriptures. Now there was a man who delivered a sermon at a baccalaureate service I think it was a year ago or so, a year and a half ago or so. And in this sermon, he said that uh, we, have, uh, we have the Bible as one of our uh, authorities, the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy, and we have tradition. And this is at 11 o'clock Sabbath morning. And this, these two authorities of the Bible and tradition have to be interpreted by the community of faith. See, that's not Absolutely only Catholic, but Jesuit. Roman Catholic. Now, the amazing thing, John, that we're seeing now is not only is the structure going in the, dis the direction that you describe, but they are aligning themselves with this administration. Well, of course. There was a Liberty, Liberty Magazine carried an article entitled, Is Clinton God's Man in it the White House? It shows Bill Clinton walking on water in front of the Washington Monument. Did, and, and you know, you know what, John, it, this article, I was utterly shocked. Blasphemy. Just Absolute shocked. blasphemy. He said that Clinton is better qualified 
to rule than King David was. We're talking about the editor of the Adventist Review saying that, that Bill Clinton is more qualified to rule than was King David. Yes, and, and the end of the article, he quotes a number of, of uh, scriptures which talk about submitting to the government, which is the type of scripture Ellen White says that will be presented to us when the National Sunday Law is passed that we have to submit to the government. Do you see where all this is leading? Unbelievable. The, the people who accept this kind of a principle operating in the structure, the next step is they support, for instance, they supported the structure against the Branch Davidians. Yeah. Over the very next day or so, we have a conference president going on the air and saying, look, this is what happens when you leave and, and you don't submit to the structure. You wind up like these people down yeah. here. They accepted the government line, hook, line, and sinker. And according to Pilgrim's Rest, Shirley Burton was right in there in the right. early stages trying to get the BATF to deal with them. You know, isn't it amazing that the conference president who made this claim the day after Waco, saying this is what happened to those who separate themselves from organized religious structure, was Don Jacobson, yes. the one who has led this denomination in apostasy of celebration yeah, yeah. and in NLP. Yeah. Isn't it amazing that he was the one that made this statement? You see, all of this points up, John, that if we don't have a different reference point, namely God and a personal individual submission to him and his word, we will not have a way of judging what is happening and we will go with the flow right over the brink into the mark of the beast. We have to be able to stem the tide, we have to resist uh, the influences in the strength of the Lord by the word of God. Oh, and, and we have to judge everything by the word of God. Now uh, back to this uh, intelligence report. This is very fascinating, it becomes very fascinating now. These Chinook H-47s can carry up to 64 personnel in one lift. The first mission for FinCEN helicopter and support aircraft is to go in and actually control ground operations. The second mission for these aircraft, though, is very important. Because of the detention camp mechanism that exists, they do not feel that it will be safe to transfer prisoners on the ground. That is why a large preponderance of the aircraft they have received are heavy lift aircraft capable of moving large numbers of people at once. Because of this, the Chinook mission will be to transfer from pickup point personnel who have been acquired and are put in temporary holding sites outside of each, each municipality. Here in the city where we are standing right now, he says, somewhere in this vicinity in close proximity, there is a holding area. There is also what we call a POL point, a petroleum oil and lubricant point. These operations will bring the people by ground to the temporary detention sites. They will never hit the ground again until they reach the detention facility itself. They will be picked up by the rotary wing aircraft flown directly to the primary detention site that's closest or to a sorting facility where it will be determined whether or not they have a high threat or a low threat. Remember MJTF police, their mission is separation and categorization of men, women and children. They will not take some individuals, but it is easier to take the whole family if they feel it is a threat. This is their mission. Once they transfer to sorting facilities and wait for individuals to be separated and then sent to primary holding areas. I guarantee that prior service military personnel, patriots, and individuals who possess firearms will not be released. That's why there are so many facilities. And then he gives some examples of various holding sites in their area there in Michigan, the Brighton Airport near Brighton, a federally funded facility. Uh, and a uh, pickup site for Ann Arbor is located beneath the Ann Arbor on Liberty Road between Parker and Zeeb. And he gives other various examples. Uh, I, want, I think now, John, we need to take a look at some of the startling developments that are taking place that have triggered a lot of concern about this. And perhaps we can start out first with the Waco situation. Oh boy, I was wondering when you were going to get to that. Because um, I, I knew uh, once you did. <laughs> however, uh, I will, let me back off here. Before we go to Waco, I do want to bring uh, another piece of evidence okay. here. So you know that this isn't the only man saying these okay. kind of things. This is a book put out by the Police Against the New World Order. It is the American Police Action Plan for Stopping World Government Rule. And we have pictures of the man who put this together and his editor. 
they are uh, uh, very uh, fine, upstanding looking uh, policemen. Jack McLam is the uh, head of this organization. He's down in Phoenix, Arizona. And I want to uh, bring to you the burden. He has some of the same materials that we've been talking about here. Uh, he's got the regional. There you see a good map of the regions, including even the uh, counties in the, in the states. Wow. Uh, regional government update 1987, as of 1987. Is, now, what, what is this now? This is the regions that the nation will be divided into under the New World Order. Isn't that Ten amazing regions. that the regions of the United States look like the corporate structures union conferences? <laughs> what if there's any parallel there? Well, there probably is. <laughs> At any rate, um, this police action plan is most interesting because the, uh, the quotes in here are just absolutely uh, shocking. He starts out by discussing what is treason and what is sedition, and he defines these. And then he tells about the New Age, New World government plan and uh, what the, that the police are on the cutting edge of this, of course. Because when you have an evil government that takes over and there's evil laws, what do the police do? Will they submit to that? Will they go along with the system and act like the policemen did in Germany? Or will they stand up for the Constitution against the New World Order? And what their hope is, is to get the police on their side. Of course, we know with the nationalization of the police, they'll just get rid of those kind of policemen and keep the ones that submit to them. Uh, here is a statement from Thomas Jefferson. Single acts of tyranny may be ascribed to the accidental opinion of a day, but a series of oppressions begun at a distinguished period and pursued unalterably through every change of ministers or administrations too plainly proves a deliberate, systematic plan of reducing us to slavery. That's Thomas Jefferson. Um, another founder said, when the government fears the people, there is liberty. When the people fear the government, there is tyranny. And then he tells about George Bush and his speech of September 11, 1990, which was entitled Toward a New World Order, and where he addressed the subject of the Gulf War and said that this war against Iraq was, quote, a rare opportunity to move toward an historic period of cooperation. Out of these troubled times, a new world order can emerge. And now George Washington, September 19, 1796, said, the great rule of conduct for us in regard to foreign nations is in extending our commercial relations to have as little political connection as possible. Why, by interweaving our destiny with that of any part of Europe, entangle our peace and prosperity in the toils of European ambition, rivalships, interest, humor, or caprice? It is our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world. That was George Washington. Wow. What a different situation than the wow. Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderbergers, the Club of Rome, the New World Order people. What our founders, what our forefathers of this nation would do if they could see and understand and know what is happening now. Well, we know what, what position the they take. What the foundations and the founders and the ancestors and our pioneers uh, were doing this in this corporate structure of our Seventh Avenue Church, if they could see and know what was going on now. I mean, the parallels, I keep, the, the parallels between our country and our, and our denominational structure is so unbelievable. That's right. And here we have Adam Weishaupt, professor at Germany's Ingolstadt University. We've spoken about him already. He founded the Order of the Illuminati May 1, 1776. Upon establishing his order of the Illuminati, he smugly reflects on his conning of the gullible Christians of his day. He said, quote, the most wonderful thing of all is that the distinguished Lutheran and Calvinist theologians who belong to our order really believe that they see in it, that is the Illuminati, the true and genuine sense of Christian religion. O oh, mortal man, is there anything you cannot be made to believe? And then... Jack McLam attacks the One World Religion Movement and ecumenicalism. He says, a high percentage of Christians today are still being conned in the same way. 
One prime example of this are the millions of Christians and most church denominations who have fallen for the New World Order plan of a one world religion being spearheaded by the United Nations National and World Council of Churches behind the battle cry ecumenicalism. So see, there's other people that are opposing ecumenicalism. Benjamin Disraeli, who was Prime Minister of England in 1844, said the world is governed by very different personages from what is imagined by those who are not behind the scenes. Now, I'm bringing some of these in to show that we aren't the only people who are talking about this kind of thing. Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of England, stated to the London Press in 1922, from the days of Spartacus Weishaupt, Karl Marx, Trotsky, Bella Kuhn, Rosa Luxemburg, and Emma Goldman, this world conspiracy has been steadily growing. This conspiracy played a de definitive, recognizable role in the tragedy of the French Revolution. It has been the mainspring of every subversive movement during the 19th century, and now at last, this band of extraordinary personalities from the underworld of the great cities of Europe and America have gripped the Russian people by the hair of their head and have become the undisputed masters of that enormous empire. That was right after the Bolshevik Revolution. He knew what it was. It was the Illuminati. That's Churchill. Bless his heart. Now, we're in good company, John. One of the great men of all I'll time. I'll tell you, if, if these people think we're nuts, <laughs> then we're in with Churchill and all Churchill of these people. Churchill was laughed to scorn, Bob, when he was telling him what the Nazis were That's doing. Right. That's they right. Let, the people of England laughed him to scorn, told him he was a raving maniac on the lunatic fringe, right. some wild-eyed fanatic. And isn't it amazing that seven, several years later, when his, when his prophecies came to fruition, they made him prime minister. That's Right. Suddenly he wasn't a nut. Suddenly he was one of the greatest men in, in, in their nation. And they flashed from one ship to another across the British fleet. Winston is back. Winston is back. And people felt relieved that uh, Winston okay, was back. Okay, the only thing I'm going to say, folks, save these videos. <laughs> <laughs> save these videos. We don't, we don't say that we're prophets by any stretch of the imagination. But I tell you, he that hath eyes, let him see. He that hath ears, let him hear. Put this stuff together, folks. Save these videos. They may be valuable. Justice Felix Frankfurter, U.S. Supreme Court Justice, said, the real rulers in Washington are invisible and exercise power from behind the scenes. John F. Hyland, mayor of New York from 1918 to 1925, said the real menace of our republic is the invisible government which, like a giant octopus, sprawls its slimy legs over our cities and states and nation. Franklin Roosevelt, U.S. President, in a letter written November 21, 1933, to Colonel E. Mandelhouse, states, the real truth of the matter is, as you and I know, that a financial element in the large centers has owned the government of the U.S., since the days of Andrew Jackson. Uh, Carol Quigley from... His name keeps popping that's right. up. You've used him in other professor, videos. Pro, and this one too. Professor of History at Georgetown University, member of the CFR, stated in his book, Tragedy and Hope, I have it here, I showed yeah, it earlier, right. the Council on Foreign Relations, CFR, is the American branch of a society which originated in England and believes national boundaries should be obliterated and one world rule established. Incidentally, that's exactly what the Pope believes, according to Malachi Martin. Professor Quigley, according to his book, was totally dedicated to the one world government program. Hundreds of our city, state, and national politicians are members of this and other New World Order groups. Governor Clinton, for example, attended Georgetown University and stated that this, his mentor, Professor Quigley, taught him so many wonderful things. And then Barry Goldwater. U.S. Senator from Arizona, when in his book, With No Apologies, stated this, the Trilateral Commission is international and is intended to be the vehicle for multinational consolidation of the commercial and banking interests by seizing control of the political government of the United States. The Trilateral Commission represents a skillful, coordinated effort to seize control and consolidate the four centers of power, political, monetary, intellectual, and ecclesiastical. Hmm. Very interesting. David Rockefeller, internationalist, billionaire, humanist, CFR, kingpin, founder of the Trilateral Commission, World Order Godfather. He spoke to his fellow conspirators at a meeting in June 1991 in Baden-Baden, Germany, the Bilderbergers. And if I'm not mistaken, that was the meeting that Bill Clinton was invited to. He said, and note this, we are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, 
and other great publications whose directors have attended our meetings and respected their promises of discretion for almost 40 years. In other words, they were careful what they reported. He went on to explain it would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we had been subject to the bright lights of publicity during those years. But the world is now more sophisticated and prepared to march toward a world government. The supranational sovereignty of an intellectual elite and world bankers is surely preferable to the national auto-determination practiced in past centuries. All right, more on the media here. And this is from John Swinton, the former chief of staff for the New York Times. He was called one of America's best-loved newspapermen, called by his peers the dean of his profession. He was asked in 1953 to give a toast before the New York Press Club and he made this monumentally important and revealing statement. He is quoted as follows, quote, There is no such thing at this date of the world's history in America as an independent press. You know it, and I know it. There is not one of you who dares to write your honest opinions, and if you did, you know beforehand that it would never appear in print. I am paid weekly for keeping my honest opinion out of the paper I am connected with. Others of you are paid similar salaries for similar things, and any of you who would be so foolish as to write honest opinions would be out on the streets looking for another job. Bob, tell me your own personal opinion. Do you believe that freedom of press is a mirage in America? Do you believe that that is a joke? It that is. It's something that we believe that we have, but we really don't be ha that we really don't have. Well, we've already pointed out that the media is under the control of the New World Order. The big CBS, NBC, uh, ABC, they're all controlled by the CFR. Tell me something. Do, ha, have you believed in years past that this maverick Ted Turner was the only one who really uh, was not controllable by the... Well, we understand he's being controlled yes, now, too. that's what... My opinion but of there CNN, is. my opinion of Ted Turner, and, and the, this whole Turner Broadcasting has changed over... And I believe he's in, the, in there with ABC, CBS, and NBC, and he's part of the conglomerate of, of liberally controlled media. Uh, have you noticed... Have you depended on CNN for a, a vital source of I your I can't news? get CNN, well, so I... Well, I have depended on CNN for some years now as my, really, my source of news. But, you know, I can't watch CNN now. I've got, I, I can't even watch CNN. That they have, that they have uh, such, they have sensationalized so much their news uh, that, and opening up with, with um, uh, crime stories. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and then the advertisements are, are so vile mm -hmm. that I, 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 what is your source of, of news to, to today? Do you use the newspaper? What, what is your source of news? Well, you, to get at the truth, you have to get a broad spectrum, I think. We, we subscribe to a lot of other analysts, financial analysts. Uh, we have probably... 10, 15, 20 different papers coming in. How do you keep by this stuff, Bob? Well, you've got to let the Holy Spirit lead you for one thing, but you have to take into consideration where your source is coming from. When you understand that CBS, NBC, and ABC are being screened, are being regulated by the New World Order personnel, the CFR, the TC, then you have a basis for understanding why they're coming at things the way they are. On the other hand, you need to be open and uh, have as an access for information the other part of the American press, which is much smaller, much humbler, newsletters by financial analysts, analysts newsletters of people that go to the site of Waco and actually research and see what's happening. And uh, you, have to, you have to have a broader spectrum, in other words, than just your mainline media news, or you'll be fitting right into the New yeah, World Order. Yeah. And so uh, it, takes, it takes some digging. But if you do subscribe to some of these other papers, then you, then you have a, a basis. If you know where they're coming from, you can take all of that into consideration and try to f render a final judgment on what's happening. And we're going to be looking at some alternative understandings of Waco here shortly. All right. But back to what has happened to the media, because this is important, because America deceives the world, according to Revelation yes. 13. And how do they do it? Through the media. 
And uh, listen, when we were in Germany, everybody watches CNN. They have CNN in German. They yeah. have it in French. They have it in Belgian. They have it in, yeah. in, in Danish. They, they have it, you know, all over Europe. Everybody watches CNN. It's, it yeah. has become the world yeah. uh, news source. The business of, of the journalist is to destroy the truth, to lie outright. This is the, what this best loved newspaperman of America said, to pervert, to vilify, to fawn at the feet of mammon, and to sell his country and his race for his daily bread. You know it, and I know it, and what folly is this toasting an independent press? We are the tools and vassals of rich men behind the scenes. We are the jumping jacks. They pull the strings and we dance. Our talents, our possibilities, and our lives are all the property of other men. We are intellectual prostitutes. Okay, when you read uh, books like Kiss the Boys Goodbye, which we mentioned earlier in this taping, the person who, the journalist who is pursuing the truth immediately finds himself up against a life-threatening situation. People are afraid to talk. They're afraid to tell what they know. They may make contact with them in some noisy business area where they mumble and speak in coded language. And, and finally, as, credi as credibility is established and credentials are established, they'll open up gradually. But they have to be very careful what they say because their life is on the line. Did they, do these people know what they're getting into when they start? They don't. They don't usually know. You know, they have an uh, innocent conception of, I want to know the truth about this and they begin finding themselves in a life-threatening situation. And, and, and the more they uncover, the bigger it gets. That's right. And the exactly. bigger it gets, the more they uncover, the more, I mean, and, uh, to, where they, to where what they thought was just an innocent little thing to start with, suddenly, the more they uncover, so, suddenly it, it dawns, it, it hits them, the magnitude of this, of this conspiracy and the vileness of this whole thing. That's right and how deep the roots of this thing go. And to, and to be affiliated with a man like you, John Grossball and the others that are standing for the truth, what a, what a pleasure it is. And as you are teaching us and showing us this stuff right here about what's going on in our country, surely those with spiritual discernment can see that that's exactly what has happened and is happening within the corporate structure. The parallels are just unbelievable. Well, this struggle over the media is exactly the struggle we're in and within our see, own structure. And you see, the journalists today in the, in, in, the, in the national media are having to make the same decision that historic Adventists have to make. Am right. I going to tell the truth? Am I going to say unpopular things? You know, uh, po politically incorrect things. You see, I'm not worried about being politically correct and saying all the politically correct things. I'm going to say the truth. That's right. And you see, that's what these journalists have to decide. That's what historic Adventists have to decide today. Are they going to tell the truth or are they going to be politically correct? Are they going to say the things that are popular and all the right buzzwords within the denomination right now that makes you popular? Or are you going to tell them the truth? That's the decision that every person has to make. You know, John, Jesus said that he that willeth to do his will, that is God's will, shall know of the doctrine whether it be of God or no. And it takes this kind of an attitude of wanting to have the truth at all costs. Buy the truth and sell it not. Absolutely. And for those who fail to walk down that road, they will never be part of the 144,000. Because Ellen White says, none but those that take a bold and unyielding stand for the truth will be able to stand Amen. through the last great conflict. Amen. Now, I have a whole book on this subject uh, written by a Frenchman, Jean-Francois Ravel, The Flight from Truth, The Reign of Deceit in the Age of Information. Are there any journalists in the United States that are telling the truth who dare to tell the truth, Bob? And if they do, what happens to them? I believe there are, but they're not part of the main media. When you watch the main media, and, and think of this when you, ever, when you see them again, they're reading something. Someone told them to read. They're, they're reading a script there. You know, a teleprompter. Sure. teleprompter. They're sitting right there and, and reading the script, and you're listening to a script that was prepared by somebody else. They're just a, a fashion person up there reading the script. But that script is being crafted by people who are under the control of the CFR. Now, this battle over the media is going on in our nation. Where are the people going to get their information from? Going uh, on in our church. Thomas, in the it's going on in our structure, <laughs> and that's why the structure is saying, don't read anything from the independent ministries. Why do they say that? 
because they don't want people to have access to the free press. They want them to only hear the propaganda that comes down through the pipeline, through the Adventist Review and Insight Magazine and uh, Liberty Magazine see, and those the, things. The, the freedom of press, the freedom of speech, is there's not only a battle of that going on in the United States, there's a battle going on in the corporate structure of Seventh-day Adventists over the freedom of press. That's why they tell the people, burn those publications that are not, quote, authorized by, by the conference. You read that letter from, Ni from Nigeria, That's from right. the Seventh-day Adventist Nigerian Conference, it. where it told the Adventist people to burn any of these publications from the independent ministries. That's right. I, there are books coming out wrestling and trying to come to grips with this whole issue. And I remember, I'm trying to remember what book I saw this in, but they quoted Thomas Jefferson who said, if I have to take a choice between newspapers, and he's talking about newspapers that give the truth, having either newspapers or a government, if that's my choice, I would choose newspapers over the government. But he's mm -hmm. talking about a, a free press yeah. that's telling the truth yeah. because it's, he's, he's basically saying it's more important for the people to have the truth than to even have a government. And uh, that was the way our founding fathers felt about it. Now here's the senior producer of CBS, Political News, Richard M. Cohen. He said, quote, we are going to impose our agenda on the coverage by dealing with issues and subjects that we choose to deal with, end quote. Richard Salant, former president of CBS News, stated, our job is to give people not what they want, but what we decide they ought to have. Yeah. Now, this is CBS. Yeah. Here's Norman Thomas, for many years the U.S. socialist presidential candidate. He said, the American people will never knowingly adopt socialism. But under the name of liberalism, they will adopt every fragment of the socialist program until one day America will be a socialist nation without knowing how it happened. And, and the Seventh-day Adventists, professed Seventh-day Adventist people, will never accept Sunday worship at face value. It will be insidiously right. brought upon them step by step through little steps of compromise to the corporate structure to where one day they will accept Sunday worship and not even know it. And they will be Sunday keepers and never even know it. And the United States, this is exactly what this man said, will one day become socialist, will be socialist and not even know it. They're being maneuvered into that Absolutely, right now. Absolutely, being maneuvered. Uh, maneuvered into it, and if they cut themselves off from all access to people who are pursuing the truth at the cost of their lives and are putting their lives on the line to give the people the truth, if they cut themselves off from those sources, there's not much hope for them. Uh, here are some other quotes. The for foreign editor of the New York Times from 1950 to 1960, Herman Dismore, said the New York Times is deliberately pitched to the liberal or that is socialist point of view. Walter Cronkite said news reporters are certainly liberal and left of center, that is socialist. Barbara Walters said the news media in general are liberals. So Their own, admitting it. There they are. George Bush, 1991, said, My vision of a new world order foresees a United Nations with a revitalized peacekeeping function. And he said, It is the sacred principles enshrined in the UN Charter to which we will henceforth pledge our allegiance. UN building, he was speaking February 1st, 1992. Pledging allegiance to the UN Charter. We grew up pledging allegiance to what? Flag. Um, America and the flag United States and the America. nation and for, the which for which it stood. Yeah, to the republic for which it stands. John E. Rankin, U.S. Congressman, said the United Nations is the greatest fraud in all history. Its purpose is to destroy the United States. Now just think that one through a little bit. All of these, na you have these nations out here that are envious of the United States. If you've ever lived overseas, you understand that. And you have papal influence in these Catholic nations. And is America going to submit to that influence? You see, w this, is, this is what we're, we're up against. The United Nations World Constitution declares the age of nations must end. The governments of the nations have decided to order their separate sovereignties into one government to which they surrender their arms. Zbigniew Zabrinsky, 
National Security Advisor to President Jimmy Carter and advisor to four other presidents, Executive Director of the Trilateral Commission, Marxist and proud of it, says this about the New World Order. The technotronic era involves the gradual appearance of a more controlled society. Such a society would be dominated by an elite, unrestrained by traditional values. Zbigniew con continues, soon it will be possible to as assert almost continuous surveillance over every citizen and maintain up-to-date complete files containing even the most personal information about the citizen. These files will be subject to instantaneous retrieval by the authorities. That's in this book, Between Two Ages. Well, the computer age gives us that. That's right. Adlai Stevenson, Council on Foreign Relations member and promoter of the UN said, the United States program or UN program calls for total elimination of national capacity to make international war. That's why we see these pictures of at first the United States and Russia with a big army of their own and the UN army being small. And then gradually their armies get smaller and the UN assumes more sure. and more and more control. Uh, the Humanist Manifesto, Article 12, declares we deplore the division of humankind on nationalistic grounds. We have reached a turning point in human history where the best option is to transcend the limits of national sovereignty and to move towards the building of a world community. We look toward the development of a system of world law, world order based upon transnational government. Uh, here is Dr. Chester Pierce, Harvard University professor, and we quoted this in the last Freedom's Ring. He's a humanist, New World Order guru. He instructs teachers and those students who aspire to become teachers of our children. Here's what he says. Every child in America who enters school at the age of five is mentally ill because he comes to school with an allegiance to our institutions toward the preservation of this form of government that we have. Patriotism, nationalism, and sovereignty all that proves that children are sick because a truly well individual is one who has rejected all of these, those things and is truly the international child of the future. He's Harvard University professor. Wow. Dr. Paul Brandwine, leading U.S. child psychologist. He instructs teachers on how to recognize mental disability in our school children. He states, every child who believes in God is mentally ill. We've come every to the, child who believes in God is mentally ill. What we, a statement. See, we've come to the point like it was in the Soviet Union where they would put people who believed in God in psychiatric hospitals. Uh -huh. And psychiatrists have the power as experts in this field to be influential in committing people to institutions for civil commitment, which ex is exerting a greater control over society than criminal commitment is. Uh, now about this values clarification that's in our schools. Here's Dr. Sidney Simon. He instruct, instructs teachers, he's a lecturer and educator. We do not need any more preaching about right and wrong. The old thou shalt not simply are not relevant. Values clarification is a method for teachers to change the values of children without getting caught. Psychiatrists are leading the way in, uh, in this. And here we have from a book, The Soviet Art of Brainwashing, a synthesis of the Russian textbook on psychopolitics written by Kenneth Goff. He writes this, during my training, I was trained in psychopolitics. This is the art of capturing the minds of a nation through brainwashing and fake mental health. Page 37, the great delusion, will you be caught? This is the police action against the New World Order. Called America's greatest female writer, Ellen G. White said it like this. Hey, man, where is this? Page 37 of this report. Oh, and he talks of... He's quoting Ellen White. Hey, man. The last great delusion is soon to open before us. Antichrist is to perform his marvelous works in our sight. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them by the Holy Scriptures. And what did he call her? Uh, America's greatest female writer. Bless his heart. This is uh, uh, McClamp. Uh, here's, here's what Lenin said. It would be the greatest mistake, certainly, to think that concessions mean peace. Nothing of the kind. Concessions are nothing but a new form of war. 
Mikhail Gorbachev at the 70th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution in 1987 said, on October 1917, we parted with the old world, rejecting it once and for all. We are moving toward a new world, a world of communism. We shall never turn off that road. And that's Gorbachev in 87. In his speech to the Soviet Politburo, November 1987, he said, Gentlemen, comrades, do not be concerned about all you hear about glasnost and perestroika and democracy in the coming years. These are primarily for outward consumption. There will be no significant internal changes in the Soviet Union other than for cosmetic purposes. Our purpose is to disarm the Americans and let them fall asleep. We want to accomplish three things. Who says this now? Gorbachev. Ah. Uh. One, we want the Americans to withdraw conventional forces from Europe. Two, we want them to withdraw nuclear forces from Europe. Three, we want the Americans to stop proceeding with strategic defense initiative. Star Wars. And you see, this is what has happened. Exactly what has happened. Now, here's some facts about uh, what is going on. Here's General Sir Walter Walker, former NATO commander-in-chief. Following the phony Soviet coup, he said, quote, I consider it my duty. Now, this is a former NATO commander-in-chief. Uh -huh. I consider it my duty to tell you of the extremely dangerous threats that lie ahead. I know for certain that we are now in a period of the greatest strategic deception Perhaps in all history, the Cold War is not over, only in the state of remission. The Soviet Union is not truly on the verge of collapse. Western defense, on the other hand, is. This hmm. is the former NATO commander-in-chief. Hmm. Fact, Russian intelligence agencies are working as hard as ever at espionage in the U.S. Both the DCI Robert Gates and FBI Director William Sessions at that time have spoken out on the high level of Russian intelligence collection efforts in recent months now known by its Russian acronym SVR. Senior FBI counterintelligence official Wayne Gilbert states the same thing. There has been no apparent reduction in covert intelligence gathering here by the Russians. And uh, fact, the KGB is still in control. We've talked about that. Fact, America and Canada are disarming unilaterally. Fact, unknown to the masses, each of the nations that have split off from the defunct Soviet Union is presently covertly led by hardline communists. Fact, the defunct Soviet military is presently building more offensive weapons of all types than at any time in its history. Production rate, one tank division per month. Kornicki says it's one and a half, as I recall. Uh, tank division, that's wow. a lot of tanks. A wow. tank division per month. Wow. 700 new fighter aircraft, approximately 58 per month in 1991 and 1992. One nuclear submarine every two months. And they've got the... Um uh, ti titanium hulls that we don't even have one, it is it which is, is the deep penetration. Yeah. It is estimated that they have close to five years food supply stored up now. The food supply in America is down to three to four months in our reserve. 